It's such a complex thing, this character. It can mean tasty things, and it can mean rotten women who are obsessed with gay men. Um, or it could just mean tofu. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host, Oscar Fuchs. Today's episode is a special one. The tightrope I'm usually walking in this series is to introduce to the outside world aspects of the lives people lead in China without going over too much familiar territory to those people who already are experts, especially the Chinese themselves. But with today's episode, my role is reversed. My guest today is Michael Z, who is a social media influencer. That much is universally understood. But despite the fact that Michael is based in China, his fan base is global. So a lot of his time is spent engaging with people outside of China. And our conversation reflects this. Much of it describes the life of a social media personality anywhere in the world, not just specifically in China. Secondly, the platform he uses is Instagram, which is actually very difficult to access from within China. So there might be listeners to this in China who haven't even seen Instagram, let alone Michael's account. And if that wasn't enough, karma is being realigned after I used the American term cotton candy in last week's episode with Gina. Michael is the first other British person that I've interviewed. So there might be moments where both of us lapse into British slang, and that might further confuse the English-speaking Chinese audience. I'm hoping this won't be the case. I think the couple of times we do it, the context is pretty clear. Despite all that, and listeners in China, I'm addressing this to you, you will definitely enjoy this episode, I promise. And about Michael himself, so Michael's background is as an educator, and there are other parts of his story that will lead you to conclude, as I did, that it's no accident that he has become the biggest and best food Instagrammer in China today. You may not be a foodie yourself, but you will want to hear the comments he makes about Sichuan chilies, Italian tomatoes, and Irish potatoes. You will enjoy the way in which Michael's family story illustrates the connection between Shanghai and Liverpool, and you will also be intrigued to hear about the glamorous and very unglamorous life of a full-time social media influencer in China. Well, thank you very much for coming today. My pleasure. I am here with Michael Z, and Michael is an Instagrammer and an author. Thanks. Yeah. And I do obviously want to ask about your object, but before I do, like, what is your Instagram account? My Instagram handle is symmetry breakfast. Symmetry breakfast. Symmetry breakfast. Yep.、Yeah. Um, all one word. And I started this account two thousand twelve ish, two thousand thirteen. And if you go onto it now, you'll see thousands of pictures of symmetrically arranged breakfasts. Well, that's a very succinct introduction. I appreciate that. Let's go, of course, go into that later. But first, what object have you brought in that, in some way, describes what you do here in China? So, my object is a ring, and this is a new ring that I've been given as a gift, maybe three or four months ago, by my dad. And it's a replica of my grandfather's signet ring. And most people are surprised when they see my face. That I'm actually a quarter Chinese. Last year, my brother had、uh, our grandfather's ring remade, recast in Liverpool, and I then a year later got given one as a gift from my dad. Yeah, the ring to me is kind of interesting because my grandfather left Shanghai in the 1930s. It's kind of like an interesting link to kind of his life here and how much the city has changed. And、um, yeah, I wear it with quite a lot of pride now, and I've kind of got very used to wearing a ring. I don't even wear a watch. So this is the kind of first little kind of piece of jewelry I've ever had. And talk me through what it actually says then.、Uh, so it says his name in reverse. It's a it's a signet ring, so you could dip it into ink or wax. And it's his his name in Chinese, Xu Bao Shan. The styling is very unusual. It's almost kind of there's something Celtic almost about it. You mentioned just there the Liverpool connection. So what's the connection then between Shanghai and Liverpool? If you go to Liverpool, there's a lot of Shanghainese people, and I think. In the period that my grandfather left during the war with Japan, he, you know, got on a boat, went to Liverpool for work. It was his job. Arrived in this other city on the other side of the world and thought, oh, I actually have probably quite a few friends here, the contacts that you know, and extended friends of friends, or you know, and he just stayed. He was on a ship going back and forth to Shanghai, Liverpool, and or within Asia, should I say, and then. The ship was reassigned to the Americas, and he lost his job. And then after that, a couple of years go by, and he then、uh, set up some Chinese restaurants in Liverpool. 
end. That was the kind of legacy that I was born into many decades later. So I grew up in Chinese chippies um, in Highton, which is a suburb of Liverpool. And if anyone knows Highton at all from the kind of mid 90s and remembers Peter's Fish and Chips um, on Finch Lane, then that Peter's my dad. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there is an interesting through line, of course, because you had adjusted your career almost in a similar way, like you weren't um, by background anything to do with food. And now your career is also connected with food. Yeah, th- 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 there was a very casual link, you know, I my dad was a cook, a, a chef, but I have no professional training in food. Um, my background is actually photography and education. I was a, a study of photography and then became a school teacher. Um, and then I went to museums. So what is Symmetry Breakfast? So if you go to your phone, if you go launch Instagram now and have a look at Symmetry Breakfast, it's just lots and lots of pictures of food arranged symmetrically. And then if you start looking carefully and reading the posts, it's there's a lot about exploring different cultures, different countries, traveling, uh, trying to go deeper than the stereotypes of what cultures are. But then also trying to understand that culture and cuisines are not fixed. They change rapidly. The cultures that we consider authentic and almost timeless, like Chinese culture, ancient culture, is actually pretty new. And you look at cuisines like Sichuan food, and uh, it's only in the last three to 400 years that they've had chilies. They came from Mexico. Um, So when you really kind of think about this, cultures like Italian food, and it's like, uh, you know, pomodoro and everything was a tomato, they're from the new world in the last three, 400 years, or uh, potatoes. You know, and you think about how Irish culture, British culture, has formed around this potato. And actually, it's an exotic new ingredient from the new world. But we completely forget that recent history. Um, and actually, we forget what our cultures must have been like without these things that we consider kind of cornerstones of our identity. So how, how did you get from that museum piece to now doing an Instagram account full time? Well, I was the museum I was actually working at was the Victorian Albert Museum in London, and I was there for f- almost four years. Uh, help! I was working on the schools program. Mark, who's now my husband at the time, we uh, recently moved in together, and he had a very busy job. He was working at Burberry and designing the men's runway show, and so he he had uh, really exhaustive deadlines and was would work very long hours. And some evenings I wouldn't see him. And so I was making a little bit of an effort to make breakfast nice. He was the breakfast guy when we first met. I used to just drink coffee and smoke rollies. <laughs> um, he was more kind of like at the weekend, oh, I'd like to sit down, have a nice, put out a nice, nice, nice spread, you know, make it a nice coffee, put some music on. And he really taught me that slow down attitude. We bought a dining table together and uh, started taking photos because my whole life I've been taking pictures and then it was Mark's boss that said I really like these images I think they're I think they're really interesting how about you rather than having them on your personal Instagram put them on to a separate channel and obviously this was long before we had social media influencers and so I had no concept of I'm going to do this for this amount of time and it's going to there was no long-term goal it was just me making breakfast for Mark and six months go by, and suddenly um, I went to a house party, and uh, one of the girls there was an editor for BuzzFeed, and she wrote a little piece about me, 15 perfectly symmetrical breakfasts. And I gained maybe like a 1,000 followers. And then a couple of months, more months go by, and I'm in a pub for a friend's birthday, and she is a shoe designer for lots of very famous uh, celebrities. Uh, and mainly people like Lady Gaga and Kylie and Kat Von D. And she's, she follows me. She's like, I love your photos, I follow you. And um, it turns out that Kat Von D saw my friend like these pictures. And so Kat Von D reposted a picture of mine saying, I wish I was inside this girl's brain. And in, an, in one evening, I gained 20,000 followers. And then it kept creeping up. And a week later, I had 30,000 
Mandalay said 50,000. And then Jamie Oliver featured me. He reposted nine images, and then it jumped up another 70,000 in, in a day. Uh, and then The Guardian approached me to do a piece, and they had, had a four-page spread in the magazine, Weekend Magazine, and it went up another 50-something thousand. It just kept going like that, huge leaps, because I got featured in uh, different magazines or other f- real celebrities. Wow, and, and all the while you were still working in the museum at this point. Yeah, every day I would get up at you know, 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning, make breakfast, go to work, and teach kids about Ming vases. I remember the first time we were ever invited by a restaurant. Please, would you like to come and have breakfast in our restaurant? I thought, oh my God, we were actually invited by a restaurant. Oh, and Mark's like, wow, cool. Things like that just st- still amazes me. Um, and so it just kept growing. And um, the next thing was I was then approached by my now agent to uh, write a book. And then four or five months later go, go by and I think, oh, okay, maybe I should think about it. And then had another meeting and uh, she said, you need to write a proposal. I was like, okay, what does that look like? So she gave me five or six other people's proposals. That Have a look at these, see the formula, the layout, um, and come back to me. So a month later, I send her this 80-page proposal. And then there's a bidding war for the book. And six publishers are fighting over it, and you know, and then suddenly I'm able to quit my job. Mm. What is the everyday of being um, an Instagrammer? Well, a lot of my everyday is admin, um, a surprising amount of admin, and Excel, um, and emailing. There's a lot of that, and planning for events in the future that maybe only last a couple of hours, but there's actually weeks of planning. And I think anyone who works in events can appreciate this. Um, I found that there was a very, in the early days of social media, there was a big surge of everyone was just social media mad. And now it's pitted out and it's become a little bit more um, difficult in terms of to translate social media engagement into real uh, you know, clicks or people turning up to your event or sales everyone's waiting for the next app that will allow growth. Instagram is billions and billions of people now. And actually, how do you get your voice out as an expert, as someone that you you can be trusted to give good advice? And I think we went through this phase of social media influencers being uh, mouthpieces for brands and being very shady about how they uh, declare those uh relationships now i'm now i follow a lot of people and you think well you've just gone there because you've been paid and i've been to that restaurant it's not very good um i wouldn't promote that and so i think people are now looking for these and i hate the word authenticity because it's it's a bit loaded and that's a whole another discussion but people are looking for these reputable voices you want to be more honest but you also want to be nice Mm. because we've all developed our personalities over the last four or five years being nice and actually then to be mean about something is incredibly hard and off character but it's easy just to say nothing in some in some instances when you don't like something and there's been times that i've just not posted anything and right yeah rather than being mean um because then you have to kind of understand your powers in a sense you know i've got 770,000 followers if i say something bad can actually have damaging repercussions to someone's business can actually shut them down so there's a there's a whole spectrum of how you behave and then you know i've often said to mark in public we have to behave it's like okay because the number of times we get uh, people don't approach us but they, they will take a picture of us eating uh, across a restaurant and then send it to me afterwards there's so many there's so many eyes watching you Mm. I mean, everything you do and every time I ever eat anything you know, everyone's now the pressure is to go vegan that's the big trend in social media especially food and, but also there's you know live no, don't wear leather um, and so on and don't fly too much and don't have children and recycle everything and use less then you end up diverting off onto different paths away from what actually what you want to do mm. You're trying to cover all bases, trying to please everyone all the time. Mm. And it becomes very stressful. And I think this is a lot of time people don't realize that 
Instagrammers with big accounts are actually also just normal people. I, I don't have staff. I don't have assistants. I don't have editors. I don't have a manager. I have an agent in London who manages jobs, but she doesn't manage me. So it really is just you. It's just me. Social media is it's um it's made me very tough um, and also quite cynical as well. Um, I get I often get emails like hi we really love what you do we'd love to have a meeting. I'm like can you just tell me what it is in an email? And if you can't do it in an email, I'm not interested in meeting. I, it's uh, I'm not going to come meet you for a jolly. And so you you come very blunt, which is also something you know, always have to be aware of and you know so it's it is an interesting world to enter and you know it's a job that I've created myself there is no job description and it's not like something that someone could else could do after me I can't step down off this role but what I like I like hearing is that you know even when you have a successful Instagram account which a lot of people like are aiming for and they spend their days trying to do it mm. you know it's not all roses and I think people need to hear that because I think they can stress themselves out and they can do inauthentic oh, things. And I know so many people who, I've got friends that message me saying, oh, I posted two hours ago it only has 16 likes and you go and like it. I'm like, okay, fine. If it makes you happy, I'll, go, I'll totally do it. It's like it's like your friend saying, I'm really upset, can you can you comfort me? Yeah, of course. Like, but it's like comfort them with a drug which is dopamine from social media. And so it's kind of, you know, mm, okay, I'll do it, it's fine. But, uh, you know, I've had times when I'm like, oh, okay, didn't get as many likes as I would hope for, whatever. Mm. You know, and it's taken me a long time to learn that. Well, that's the cynical side taken care of. What, a, <laughs> <laughs> what, what about the things that you still derive pleasure from? Because obviously you are still doing it. Like, which, which are the things that you still wake up and go, oh, wow, yeah, this is, this is good? Um... I mean, when we when I do events and I meet people and they they come say hello to me and they say I've followed you from the beginning and they know things that I've forgotten about They're like oh that time you went to this restaurant or this country or whatever I'm like oh my god you remember that how crazy like they really really um, they they love the concept they love um, to see me mark they love uh, to learn about the things I'm interested in. Those are the moments that I really, really like. It's it's really astonishing how social media has given people that traditionally you would never cross paths um, because of various reasons. You know, you, but now you meet up at these places and you uh, you know you go for drinks or dinner and you um, you know you meet through all, like the most bizarre things and you, you then you're best like friends. But then this is illustrates the point perfectly is that the social media as a way to have real world engagement in terms of meeting real people um, is the formula of of success if you use social media to make new friends that's great but if you use social media to isolate yourself it can be extremely damaging so it's how do you use social media I mean, it's like gamers you, you play games online all day and they have these friends that they play games with across the world and they have these avatars and and then you hear these stories of them traveling across the world to meet their friend who lives in a different country and they're best friends because they've been playing computer games for five six years never met and then they're like well we should actually meet in real life and that's the amazing thing about social media and and, and technology it should bring you together it shouldn't imagine never being able to meet this person in real life it would be that would be horrible but yeah, these people who meet through computer gaming, I think is an amazing story. And I think this is what social media should always try and facilitate. And we've talked very much in the abstract um, in terms of geography throughout this um, this conversation. You know, we could have been talking about your life in London. We could have been talking about someone else's life in the U- in the US. So what what about your life here in China? How have you managed to to meld your online social media life with your real life here in China? The way it's shifted, my, my Instagram has shifted is to explore as much of China and its food and its places as possible. To be kind of this, you know, food correspondent that goes and sees caviar farm in Zhejiang province or goes to a a tea plantation in Yunnan or goes to see this old town somewhere or this water town or a a restaurant on the Bund. And people really appreciate that window into China that's um, not political. 
Um, and sometimes it's just the street food and sometimes it's just everyday life. But sometimes it's to see something being manufactured or farmed or grown. And then it gives people a really understanding of this, how diverse China is. Um, I think that's how I pivoted away, or pivoted the, my Instagram into becoming uh, more exploratory of China. Michael, thank you. Um, we're now going to move on to part two. Oh, yes. Great. Part two. So question one. What is your favorite China-related fact? That ni hao doesn't mean hello. Um, I think this is the interesting thing about translation, is that we kind of always want to have equals, equivalents of words. This word in my language means this word in your language. And actually, hello and ni hao. Ni hao is you good, literally, you good. And th- it's implied there's a question, whereas hello is... I'm as a, as a kind of acknowledgement of like I'm here, but I'm not asking for your recognition. Hello, in the sense of you can just say hello to an empty room, but you would never say ni hao to an empty room. And I think this is this is the interesting thing about a lot of Chinese words and a lot of translation and linguistics in general is that it's not always so neat and tidy. Um, ni hao is the closest thing to hello, but it's not hello. Mm. Yeah, nice. Do you have a favorite word or phrase in Chinese? Uh, yeah, um, I really like the word fu, as in dofu. And it, in Chinese, it means rotten. But in another sense, the, that word can also be something that's delicious. And you know, you've got uh, furu, and this is like rotten breast milk. It's you know, the mother's milk rotten. And actually, in Chinese culture, this word is used a lot of times for things that are just preserved and, uh, um, you know, pickled or fermented. And actually, in a Western sense, that rotten is always pretty bad. Rotten eggs or rotten person, the, the word rotten, rotten wood, it's, there's always a negative connotation. Whereas in Chinese culture, it's not necessarily bad. It's such a complex thing, this character. It can mean tasty things and it can mean rotten women who are obsessive gay men. Um, or it could just mean tofu. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, that one is hard to unpack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite destination within China? Chandaohu, uh, Thousand Island Lake. It's in Zhejiang Province. It's about two and a half-ish hours um, on the train from Shanghai, and it's a man-made lake. It was created when in 1959 by when they constructed a dam. And now it's one of the cleanest uh, lakes in the world. And I went for my birthday, and it was so beautiful. Okay, next question. If you left China, what would you miss the most, and what would you miss the least? Uh, for both is old people in pyjamas. <laughs> um, I Now I'm slightly not phased by it, but it's still surprising, and I find it surprising that it's, pretty much only Shanghai that does this. When you go to other cities, the Chinese people do not do this. Um, And I think when you see, you know, the 90-year-old man carrying his trash out and he's in his giant underwear with his slippers on and no other clothes, it's just, I don't know, it's just really, I'm shocked that I'm not shocked anymore. Is there anything that still surprises you about life in China? I think that The biggest surprise now is just how much ahead of the Western world China is. And this is something that everyone who comes to visit me, they're so shocked. They're, you know, oh, old communist China has, like, better apps, better taxi services, better uh, all these things. And, you know, it's so easy to just click your fingers and you get something. Where's your favorite place to go out to eat or drink or just generally hang out? Uh, well, one of my new favourites is uh, Heritage by Madison, which is a lovely new restaurant down at the Bun Financial Centre, next to that lovely Thomas Heatherwick building that moves. Um, and it's Austin Hugh, and he is m- probably, most people would know him as the guy behind the diner, which he's now left the group, and he's uh, opened another restaurant down by the river. And it's uh, excellent. Um, you know, it's this kind of very, you know, it's a Western casual fine dining with lots of Chinese influences, really nice wine list, really inexpensive, 
stunning setting, world-class service. Nailed it. What is the best or worst purchase you have made in China? Oh, oh best purchase is a beautiful chair and um, from Taobao. And Taobao is an amazing online platform for those of you who don't know Chinese e-commerce. You have a direct link with the factory or the vendor or the individual selling. It doesn't come from like Amazon as such. Um, so you can have this conversation with someone, I want to buy a sofa, um, but you don't just click the color you want. They send you the swatch and you can have this long conversation. Oh, actually, can I have it 10 centimeters longer? Can I have it a little bit deeper? Can I have it uh, in blue? And also, can I have it this fabric? And so you can really have this conversation. We had this chair made, which is um, admittedly a knockoff of a Finn Yule. Um, it was a very famous Scandinavian designer. And the original chair is something like 10 to 14,000 euros. And we had this, a knockoff commissioned in baby pink, um, beautiful soft baby pink leather for 500 pounds. What's your favorite WeChat sticker? My favorite WeChat sticker is this little girl that's saying bye. Um, it is the perfect way to end a conversation. I'm looking at it now. Yes, you know who this is, right? This is I, I know I know she's famous for something, but I can't know what. <laughs> this is Honey Boo Boo. Oh, that's it. Honey Boo Boo, yeah. What is your go-to song to sing at KTV? Oh, so KTV, I've actually never done KTV in China. Um, I've only ever done karaoke in Japan. My last memory of um, karaoke in Japan was um, this enormous skyscraper that was like 10 floors of rooms. And they had costumes. You could pick a costume to wear whilst you sing. And so I was a beer bottle giant beer bottle and Mark was wearing the Bjork swan dress <laughs> and we were with a big group of people from France and um, uh, I remember they were this French team um, they were they were like oh we're going to be so good at this and then when we actually got in the room they were really bad and just really kind of like oh you guys sing and I remember putting on um, Nirvana and uh, the, they just went wild. And I've got a video of them head head banging to Nirvana. It was Nirvana smells like teen spirit. Okay. <laughs> and finally, what other general information sources or China-related media do you rely on? Uh, so my favorite is Sixth Tone. Sixth Tone. Um, they are a uh, Shanghai-based English language, uh, Chinese long read platform as they do these long reads um, you know, and they tell you how long they're going to you, you need to read them six to 20 minutes and they're on all sorts of subjects and the the, 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 the I think one of their most read but also one of my favorites is uh, the history of hot water in China and why do Chinese people drink hot water that sounds great I think you've mentioned that before to me in the past and I always promised that I'd go and check it out but I haven't done so yet so you've you've nudged me again now actually the, the first person who was in this series Philippe Gass mm. That was one of the things that still mystified him about life in China, that he's always offered hot water. So I'm going to have to but send him that link. It's a, it's a recent invention. Really? Since the revolution. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you once again, Michael. Thank you very much. Before you leave, um, I ask the same question to everyone who's sitting in that seat. And that is, for the next season of Mosaic of China, who do you recommend that I interview next? I would like to hear more from my friend Crystal Mo. And she is someone I actually only met recently. And she is the chair of Asia's 50 Best Restaurants. And she's also an amazing uh, connector of people. She's extremely eloquent. And she's just been someone that I've immediately clicked with. I remember we met recently at an event. I won't say which brand. And we were both left with a kind of very cynical view of the, the situation and we were kind of have we just try, have they just tried to spoon feed us this propaganda and we both kind of clicked and we thought wow you you come to exactly the same conclusion as i have and i think that's where we kind of struck up our friendship excellent i look forward to meeting crystal thank you so much michael thank you again ni hao i liked what michael said about the phrase ni hao you definitely wouldn't say it to an empty room in fact, I must say, I don't really hear it very often at all in natural speech in China. It's used to foreigners, 
because the Chinese know that we understand it. But when I'm greeting people in my neighborhood, I'm much more likely to hear Chilama, have you eaten? Or Chunali, which is where are you going? Those are the substitutes for hello that I'm more familiar with these days. So in case someone Chinese ever asks you, have you eaten? Or where are you going? You might think that they're being bizarrely intrusive, but actually they're just saying hello. I wish I could have heard this advice myself 10 years ago. I lived for six years in Singapore and I heard this said in English all the time and I don't think I ever figured it out until living in China many years later. What I've particularly enjoyed about getting to know Michael over the last few months is that he confounds the expectations of what you might imagine a social media influencer to be. I would have always assumed that they would be vapid and superficial and narcissistic. But Michael's combination of skills from the world of teaching and museums on the one hand, mixed in with his skills in photography and food on the other, make him to be a much more thoughtful and deliberate person than you might otherwise have given him credit for. Speaking of which, there was a lot of information in this week's episode, so let me smash through this as quickly as possible. Firstly, there are many, many connections between Shanghai and Liverpool that we didn't get into. Just have a quick look online and you can see the several landmarks that look almost identical in both cities. Shamefully, I've never once been to Liverpool, even though my cousin studied there for three years. So it's gone to the top of my list for places that I must try and visit next time I'm in the UK for long enough. Speaking of the UK, I'm pretty sure we didn't use too much slang in this interview. I only noticed two examples. One was the word chippy, which means a fish and chip shop. And the other was a reference to smoking rollies, which are roll your own cigarettes. The reference to rotten women, or funyu, that Michael made in passing, is about a subculture of women in China who are obsessed with gay men. I found an interesting BBC article about this phenomenon. Uh, with a reference to Sherlock Holmes, actually. I won't say any more about that. Uh, I've posted the photo uh, on social media, so please take a look there. We're on Mosaic of China on Instagram or Facebook, or you can add me on WeChat with my username Oscar10877, and I'll add you to the group there. The other images I've posted um, include, of course, Michael's object, the very handsome signet ring. That's got his father's name on it, which is Shu Baoshan, and Shu is Michael's family name. It was anglicized to Z because this was the closest to how it sounds in the Shanghainese dialect. So there you go, the difference between Xu and Z, just in case you thought learning Mandarin wasn't difficult enough. Then there is the Honey Boo Boo WeChat sticker. There's the Victoria and Albert Museum in London where Michael used to work. Michael also mentioned Kat Von D and Jamie Oliver as two people who amplified his social media status early on in his Instagram career. So there's a photo of both of them. Kat Von D is an American tattoo artist and Jamie Oliver is an English chef. There is uh, a photo of Michael dressed up as a beer bottle for Japanese karaoke. There's uh, Heritage by Madison, the Shanghai restaurant that he recommended. There's Qian Dao Hu, which is uh, Qian Dao Lake or a Thousand Island Lake the place that Michael said was his favorite destination within China. It looks amazing. I don't know why I haven't been there before. There is a photo of the pink knockoff chair that he had made on Taobao. There is a photo of an old man walking in pajamas on the streets of Shanghai. This is actually a photo that I posted on my own personal Instagram, um, and it was back in October 2016, when it was still a novelty for me. Again, this seems to be something that happens mainly in Shanghai, but please let me know if you know it happens elsewhere in China. Thank you for listening this far. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs, editing by Milo De Prieto, artwork by Danny Newell, and China technical support from Alston Gong. Please like, comment, share, do all those things. If you don't, I'm going to find you, I'm going to hunt you, and I'm going to beg and cry hysterically. <laughs>